Hello, curious minds. Welcome to season one of Mentorless Podcast, a show where I have in-depth conversation with visual storytellers about one particular project. Together, we look at the creative and tactical steps they took from having an idea to releasing their finished project into the world. I'm your host, Nathalie Sejan, and in this episode, I talked with British filmmaker Portia Barnett Herrin about the making of Killing Cora, a silent and black and white film that also was her first feature film. Kevin Smith maxed out credit cards to make his first feature. Robert Rodriguez underwent beta testings in hospitals to pay for his first feature. What would you be willing to do to make your first feature? Through Portia's story, we look at the skill set one needs to make and sell a movie. In this episode, we talk about how to turn fear into adrenaline, the balance between prep and budget, the benefits of trying out your ideas in a short form first, ways to raise your chances to get your film picked, and much, much more. Don't forget to subscribe via Apple Podcast, Podcast Addict, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or any other app you use. You just need to search for Mentorless Podcast and click on the subscribe button. Enjoy the ride, and I'll see you on the other side. Portia, thank you very much for being on the show with me. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. We met for the very first time in London when I did the first uh, mentorless meetup in 2014. You were working on uh, your first feature film that is currently named Killing Cora, and this is the project we're going to talk about. So, le okay, let's start with the question of present time. If you meet someone at a party tonight, let's say, and they ask you what you're doing, what do you answer? I still feel like I need to have a better answer for that question. <laughs> I would say that I have just started a YouTube channel about what I learned from making my first feature and that I'm also juggling a few other projects as always. This is like right now, this is your main focus is a YouTube channel? No, I don't think I ever have a main focus except for when I'm like really in the thick of making a film. I think that there's a huge benefit to having three or four projects In, that I'm working on sort of in tandem. But the YouTube channel is a large focus and is also um, very new for me. It's completely like new ground for me. So it's sort of the most surprising and the most challenging, maybe. Let's travel back in the travel back machine. Can you tell us what you were doing in 2013 as your day job? Uh, where you were at in terms of filmmaking, thinking about making a movie, and what led you to decide to make your first feature film? 2013, I was um, working as a session runner for a casting director. I'd worked, and I still do work, in, in the casting industry, which basically means facilitating the casting of commercials, like TV commercials. I've been doing that for a few years, and I love doing it. It's it's fascinating. It's quite challenging. I've learned a lot and it's been extremely it's been extremely useful for me as a director. So that was my my day job. It's freelance, extremely uh what's the word? You know, like feast or famine. Goes very quiet for two weeks and then extremely intense. But I was I was kind of a I was kind of adjusted to that. And in terms of filmmaking, I was I'd worked, I'd made some shorts. And I had decided that features were my my main goal. As a result of that, I'd worked as crew on two features previously. And I'd learned a lot. Actually, it was right at the end of 2012. I was with my editor, who is kind of my creative, or certainly was my creative partner on, on Killing Cora. And we were just sort of slightly frustrated And also, I think, coming to the realization that there was never going to be a perfect time to try and make your first movie, that it was always going to be really scary. And I think also that we I think we felt sort of quite bolstered by our relationship, by our sort of uh, we always were on the same path in terms of just thinking about films, watching films. And so we decided we were going to do it together. We were essentially we were going to bring ideas to the table and sort of workshop them a little bit and then choose one and then make it. So to place us a little bit on the timeline, between the moment you said, oh, let's let's do a feature film, let's brainstorm ideas, to the moment you started sitting, how did you go from that point? Did you budget or did you have money and decided to write for budget? Yes, so that was right at the end of 2012. And 
I think we we probably met like six to eight times and had coffee fueled sugar fueled sessions and I have to say that like our dynamic is like for better and worse is that very few ideas get shut down it's a very fast paced back and forth sort of high energy connection and so that can be that led us to quite reckless places sometimes but also it's very fun so I think that we quite quickly arrived at the idea of the what we called then the cello assassin. That was the film's sort of first working title. And there were a couple of things at work that impacted the timeline of the project. First of all, I'm an impatient person and so is Lee. And like I said, very bouncy energy. But the major things were that, one, I had inherited 30 grand from my great aunt, probably like three years previously. And I'm very impressed with my younger self. I had not really spent it. I just sort of sat on it. And at the time, I was incredibly scared of the idea of a mortgage and didn't think I'd ever be able to get one and just never conceived that I could be someone that could own property. So I had that sitting in the bank and she was an extremely like business savvy. She was a hustler. She was very, very forward thinking woman. She was a very important person to me and I had been the beneficiary of of her passing because she didn't have any children. So I decided that that was going to be the budget for our movie. That was very exciting. I don't think I don't think I realized that I was going to have to spend all of it <laughs> until a little bit later, but I thought I made a decision that that would be a great way to spend her legacy and to invest in myself and that she would understand that. So, that was on the table and I think also reinforced our confidence again for better and worse because sometimes having access to your own budget can be quite precarious <laughs> for a first time filmmaker and then another thing that happened was my grandmother became sort of very unwell and my parents went to stay with her and take care of her so at the time they had a decent sized house in london which was empty except for a very old cat and I saw that there was an opportunity to essentially turn the house into our mini studio. So it was like our production office. We put the edit suite in there and we got, I think we probably got about seven locations out of it. It had like a basement, which we sort of very cleverly disguised with a Susie, who's our art director. And just that there was huge opportunity in having access to that space, but also that that, that access was kind of limited. We didn't know how long we would have access to it for. So I think that that increased the pace of like the timeline of the whole project because it was probably the spring of 2013 that my parents moved out and I saw and I saw how to take advantage of a, a stressful family time. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, and to be perfectly honest, I responded quite well to that urgency, but I wouldn't recommend it in general in making films, but I didn't really know. I didn't know nearly as much as I do now about preparation and I didn't understand about how to be rigorous in my work. So for me, it was extremely exciting. And because there was a rush, it allowed me to sort of bypass what probably would have been major fear and just sort of turn it into adrenaline. How did you go about the uh, screenplay? Did you write a screenplay? Did you do a pass and then Lee did one, etc.? I mean, how did, how did the writing process work and what was your story base to work on? We didn't write a traditional screenplay. We did write a story with the scenes mapped out. And that document was what I gave to the actors and the people who I approached to work on the film. So the story was outlined. Once we had decided on the cello assassin, we would have sessions discussing it together. Then I would go away and write and I would send it to Lee and he would say, yeah, this is great. That's exciting. I don't get that bit or whatever. And I think I feel like it was an incoherent document. But I also know that we convinced strangers to work with us and that it made sense to them. <laughs> and I also know that people who read that document and then saw the film when it was finished said that it was basically the same thing which I was very very surprised by so as is maybe often the case and is again not I think ideal we were sort of developing and in pre-production at the same time basically we were experimenting with format and experimenting with like can we make production work sort of simultaneously at some stage and I cannot remember exactly when we decided to make a silent film. And that was a response 
response to budget and it was also and I can go into it if you'd like a response to very interesting advice I got from the guy who did our sound mix I would love actually for you to talk more about that but I just have a couple of questions before yeah, yeah, before we get into that you have 25,000 pounds yeah. but you don't you haven't decided yet that that was your budget you just decided I have money and I will use that money to fund the movie in any ways that it needs to be funded is that correct uh sort of I I thought I'm gonna spend 10 grand on the movie just arbitrary just totally reckless I, I thought that's a good that's a good round number <laughs> I have access to it let's make a movie for 10 grand and then It was during sort of our pre-production, I realized we were rushing it. And I also realized that, you know, to a degree, it's like, I, I don't know, I can't, I can't completely go back to like my naive self. But I, I, I'd like to think that a deeper wisdom within me saw that if you're going to rush it, you're going to have to spend more. Like you can make a feature for 10 grand. You can make a feature for a grand if you really want to. But your preparation is worth so, so much. And we we did not have that. And also, in terms of your psychology, it's like the lower you invest, sort of like the lower the stakes. And I, I think I saw at some point that in order for me to really face my fears, I was going to have to invest more and not sort of limit it. Because I, you know, like I said, it was an arbitrary number. I didn't know how to write a budget. I still don't really know how to write a budget. And I didn't have a producer. So it was like, if you're going to invest, why don't you invest more and, you know, sort of surrender to the process? Um, and I think I realized that quite early. You've mentioned several times preparation. Right now, if you were to do it again, and I'm guessing you will do it again, what is preparation for you right now? What, what were the missing points for uh, the cello assassin back then that you, you would do today? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, there were so many. I mean, we were so, so not prepared. We, it was like a Rubik's Cube of like unresolved creative issues. It really was wild. So I, I, I'm not totally sure if I could say exactly what I would do again with, with this project. But what preparation means for me now, I'm trying to give you a concise answer. I think, honestly, it's like, have you simplified your intention as much as you can? Have you condensed the sort of because it plot is like by nature quite complex right the story it's like you have to be in service of the story and if you're making a feature you got 90 minutes minimum of story right so obviously a lot of stuff is going to happen sorry if this is a little bit too abstract but I think it's like who is who are your characters how well do you know them because I really only understood our main character in post and you know, wh wh why, basically, like, it's, it's because preparation, there's like, there's literal preparation, like, how are you going to shoot the scenes? And have you got your shot list? And you know, the, the stuff that is kind of all of the delicious, complicated joy of production. But at the very, very core of it is like, what is this story? Why do you care about it? And if you can, what is the tone? A like, tone is so, 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 so important to me. Those things of course, shift over the long time it takes to make a film. But I think if you have some sense of the why and your intention, then you've got an anchor that you move, or you've got like a compass that you're going to move from. And to, to try and prepare without that is like sort of you're just treading water. Um, to go back to uh, the budget, because I'm really interested about a lot of aspects of your film, but one of the things that I find interesting is you didn't have to pay for location. And how many people were involved in the making of the movie in terms of pre-production and production? I think in prep, it was like we had a production coordinator. We didn't have a producer, which was a huge... I want to say disability, but I know that that's not politically correct. But anyway... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah it would have been really good to have a producer but we didn't have one so but I did have a production coordinator and uh Lee as I mentioned he's the editor and uh, for all intents and purposes me and Lee co-produced it together so it was me and Lee and then we had a coordinator we had our art director Susie Bruff who 100% saved my my life basically my creative sanity um and was a joy and Our DP, we actually, our first DP walked about two weeks before we started shooting 
because he had like quite dramatic personal stuff going on. So we brought in another DP at very short notice who managed to do our camera deal for us. So there was like four or five of us in prep. They were not uh, paid or you paid some of them? I'm guessing you and Lydia were not paid. People were paid. We shot for 21 days and people were paid a token fee of £500 to respect their rent, uh, to make a contribution towards their rent. And they were fed extremely well because I believe in that a lot. People weren't paid for their prep, but there weren't that many people in prep and they had access to a role that they hadn't done before. Okay, basically, one of uh, the things I'm curious about is where did the money needed to need to go? What, what was expensive and how did things started flowing away from the wallet, basically? It's all a haze of receipts and online payments. Um, we paid, it was food and it was camera and lenses and it was insurance for the equipment, uh, which is scary. It's scary, it's scary to be in, responsible for that much, that much equipment. And then it was, I did the costume. It was a little bit on costume. I think costume is very, very important and is easily neglected on a low budget. Susie, uh, our art director at the time, had like a, it was like a, a very big sort of ha half van that you we got the lights in. And so I think we probably spent a decent amount on her petrol and getting the lights around. But the truth is, is that it just, I stayed on top of it and I paid for things as they needed to be paid for. And it was not very organized, but I've got a sense for numbers, basically. And I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a more professional answer than that. No, it's fine, it's fine. It's just that it's interesting because, you know, people often say, see what you have, which is what you did. You had a house, you had a little bit of money. It seems like on paper right now, you're making the very... Uh, yes, maybe you, you go a little bit quickly on your story, but you're making the right steps that everybody is telling indie filmmakers to do, that everybody uh, is telling, you want to make films? Shoot a film. So this is what you did. But even when you have all these things, it still costs some money and some money that is not 1K. Um, basically, what I was trying to get at is, do you have a sense of how much it costs you before entering post-production and distribution, which we'll get into later? Because there is this myth that I think is a false myth and is breaking a lot of people that when people are telling you, I made this on a zero budget, it's a lie. I mean, it's impossible. I don't see how this is possible unless your parents are very rich and then you're spending their money. So mm -hmm. um, it's still costing money, basically. You, you cannot say I made a movie for zero dollars. Even food, just as you said, like 21 days of feeding people costs some money. I think it was actually, it might have actually been our largest expense. And I remember the, the guy who we rented the camera from was like, tried to lecture me about it uh, because he thought that you should spend more on your equipment than on your food, which I don't agree with. Um, for sure, it, it costs money. Um, no, it doesn't cost nothing. If you're making a short and you're making something that is going to look exactly like your life looks and you're very, very smart about shooting on an iPhone, I think that you can make something for a few hundred dollars. But I'm not interested. I'm not trying to make movies that look exactly like my life. I'm trying to make genre movies that have a, a that are stylized and that are visually really, really interesting. And I think that the thing about the no money thing is, you know, it's so true that you can do it for very, very little. And I think that when you're doing that, you have to be you have to be willing to have people that are hungry, but not experienced. You can't be precious about anything other than the, than your sound, basically, um, and your exposure. It, it is possible to make stuff which will deliver your tone if you have under, come to understand yet what that is. But I'd been working in film for like six or seven years before I started making this movie. And my DP was completely trained and understood how to expose film. So he understood my references and he understood the kind of 1940s, 1950s movies and what that lighting really meant. He understood how to deliver that. I think he actually he negotiated a higher rate for himself. He was the most experienced person on the set and it showed, it showed in the film. But basically, like when it comes down to it, it's a team sport and like your team need to be 
at the very least fed and watered, but also they need to be moved around with their equipment. And then I think they do need to be paid. So why should it cost nothing? You know what I mean? And and I don't think that films benefit from being inexpensive. Like, I don't think that they need to cost $250 million. You know, that is inflated. And maybe it's well spent. Maybe it isn't. Like, who's to say? So to go back to the cello assassin slash killing Cora, you made a number of decisions during pre-production that were artistic and uh, also dictated sometimes by budget, as you mentioned. So your, your film was shot directly in black and white, I think. There's no sound, there is no dialogues, and there is a little bit of a comic, uh, I don't know if this is how you're, you're saying it, but comic vibe to it. Can you tell us a little bit about how you made those different decisions about the visual of the film? Yes, of course. So we knew she was an assassin and we had the rough outline of the story. And I'd worked with this guy called Ro, who did our sound mix, who's very experienced. And I think sound is so important and I love sound. I'm so fascinated by it that I wanted to know that we were going to do our post for someone who really knew what they were doing. So I met with him before I met with him like while we were in prep and he said, I'll do it for expenses But if you bring me badly recorded sound, I'm going to spend all my time just cleaning up the sound and not doing something great with it. And, um, you know, it just struck me as such a waste of talent and energy. If you if you have badly recorded sound, it's like you have to bring it up from minus from minus 10 to zero rather than starting at zero and, and taking it up to 10. And again, you know, it was a conversation with Lee, my editor, and I was like, what should we do? It would be 50% of our budget, basically, to pay a great sound recordist. We were on location, we were on streets, we were under flight paths. I didn't trust a student. I didn't want to trust a student with what I thought was going to be one of the most crucial aspects of the film. And I sort of casually said, what if we made it a silent film? Like, she's an assassin. She's already, we'd had this thing that she, she killed people with knives. She was direct. She was isolated and didn't speak to people much. That was already like in our awareness of the character and the story. So the idea of it being silent sort of connected with some of the themes of it. Plus, we like crazy ideas and we sort of egg each other on um, in a in a fun and dangerous way. So we both thought, oh, that's a great idea. And it's a huge challenge as a filmmaker. Can you still tell the story? And, as, and we kind of committed to it. We thought it was exciting. So where we had scenes that didn't have that much dialogue anyway, we just reduced the dialogue. I stripped the dialogue way back and made it completely without dialogue where we could. Funnily enough, it re people really responded to it. All of the actors were like really excited about it. And I think people just like the experimentation, I guess. At that stage, we didn't know if we were going to, because also I'm a huge like fan of typography and graffiti and lettering. And so we were like, maybe we'll have, we'll do what the classic silent films did and cut to title cards. Or maybe we'll do what I think they would have done then if they had the capacity was just put the text on the screen. And so... During our post-production, there was like loads of versions of like different weird typography and we used different fonts for different characters. We did that for ages. It was really fun for us, but did not translate in the end. And it was quite a long, it was after, it was definitely after like six months of, of painful post-production that the comic book bubble, the speech bubbles arrived. And it was just like such an, it's like, I cannot believe neither of us thought of it sooner because We're both comic book readers. It was so obvious when we when we saw it. I could I couldn't believe we hadn't seen it earlier. But yeah, it was it was a creative decision that yeah was born out of financial realities and and also for me out of respect for sound. But the funny the thing that was interesting is that it made our it made our pose harder and easier at the same time because it meant that we could rewrite all of it. Like we could rewrite the whole thing, and so. We did again and again and again and again. And I went crazy rewriting these scenes to try and get the tone. And it's why I think in a lot of ways, it's a great thing to try out probably more in a short form than a feature when you're first starting out. Because, you know, what do young filmmakers do? They write like slightly cringy dialogue. 
But what you know, it's great if you can rewrite your cringy dialogue and make it better, which was what we were able to do in some places. How long was the production before you started shooting? A few months? Yeah, a few months. We were shooting by June. You were working uh, full time during that same period? No, I was running sessions, and then I think about about six weeks before we started shooting, I stopped and I just prepped the film, and then we shot the film. And um, you said you shot for 21 days? Yes. How did these 21 days go? How was the shooting? Can you talk to us a little bit about this, this period? Yeah, of course. It was, I think it was quite a long time. Yeah, it was a challenge getting people to commit, but we did get them. And how was it? It was a thrill. It was very, I love production. It's tough, but I love it. But we had enough time, basically. Did you rehearse with actors before the shooting or was that included inside the shooting time? I rehearsed with them a little bit. Of course, we didn't have any dialogue. So, you know, it was more about establishing relationships. And so uh, Rosie Benjamin, who played the assassin, is uh, was someone I'd known for a long time and we'd worked together before. And so she had been preparing and doing some kung fu. And obviously she's a very isolated character. So the issue was actually more like integrating her with the crew than um, rehearsing. And... Yeah, we had, I think we, I think we probably had like a, about four or five days of also like figuring out costume and looks. And then also the villain has a, has like a right hand man and their relationship was really, really important. So we had a day, we probably had half a day together and then I sent them off to hang out for a day, which really, I was like, go out for lunch and then just tell me what you just give me the bill. And That really paid off. That really, really paid off. That, So I think, look, like, in an ideal world, I'd have, like, 10 days rehearsal, I think. But a lot of that is actually just building relationships, being comfortable with each other, um, solving problems, and also answering people's questions. Because, like, it's not just the questions that I want to solve. It's that people feel that their questions are answered to enable people to show up, like, and really be ready to go when it's time to shoot. Just out of curiosity, you shot, do you remember on what camera you shot? We shot on a red dragon, I think. Were you happy with it? Yeah, I was. We were shooting for the most part on Cook lenses. A lot of it was that we had this zoom lens. So here's the thing that I think, obviously cameras are, are very important and different different qualities of cameras produce very different images. But designing your lighting and having a DP that understands what you're reaching for is the, is the huge like counterpoint to it because you can if you point at an amazing camera a badly lit soundstage it's not going to look very good you know and um for better or worse like i think it was a slightly confused but like i said like i was slightly confused but my dp completely understood my references and so he understood the lighting style And he basically used, and so the light, because we knew we were going to shoot black and white, but black and white could be anything, you know, and this was actually more like, as I said, like late 40s, 50s style. So um, Auron used kind of slightly old lights, uh, which were easy to get and understood how to design the lighting. And, uh, and as a result, I was really happy with the images that came out of it because he knew what he was doing. And we had a great gaffer as well, who's very patient. And that stuff makes makes a huge, you know, that's and that and, and that's why it's like, yeah, everyone should get paid. You know, you need all their skills. Definitely. So you finished shooting at the end of uh, June or beginning of July, I guess, 2013. Yeah. Before you tell us what was the next step after that, I, I have a question. While you were prepping, how did you think about the afterwards? What was your strategy, if you had any strategy, about what you wanted to do with this movie? Did you budget anything for distribution slash film festivals? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I had no idea. I certainly didn't budget anything for it. I budgeted a little bit for like post production, like sound mix. I was aware of that coming, but I didn't budget anything for festivals. And I knew that we had quite large creative problems to solve, mainly the silent thing, mainly how was the silent thing going to work and what were we going to do with the text on the screen. So that loomed much larger for me than 
like distribution or strategy or what came next. So when you decided to do this feature film with Lee, but before you even started doing it, when it was just like, we want to make a film, let's make a feature. Uh, what was, uh, I don't know, what was the, the impulse or desire under it, if any? Were you just attracted about the idea of making the movie? And I'm asking because, as a matter of fact, it often turns out that we don't think about these things until we have to face them the first time, or if you have a producer, the producer is going to take care of it, but oftentimes we don't place our first moves as filmmaker into a bigger web mm. of moves toward a goal. And I'm just wondering, like, you were, you were going for this feature, you knew you wanted to make a feature, you were willing to spend money, but it was for the joy of making the film, basically. It's a good question. I actually think it was to see if I could. Okay. I think it was, the, it was the challenge of it and to test myself, which is a good and not good reason for making a film. And I realized that somewhere in our post-production like a bit later probably like a year after we finished shooting I realized that but it was it's it's a good question as well because it's complex and we are complex and to fully understand your motivation sometimes you have to act and then and then sort of like try and unravel what was really going on so you wrapped the movie and then It was summer 2013 what, what happened next um I felt really really bad for a couple <laughs> I, of weeks. You felt bad after wrapping the... Because yeah. why, why did you feel bad? I felt really terrible. Do you know what? It was It was only after I felt bad. I, sorry, to we'll go back in time, but it was only after we delivered it and I felt bad again that I started to figure out what was going on. But basically, I didn't have a producer that was outside of me. It was me and Lee were responsible for the production. And there is a huge value in having someone who can occasionally be, in quotation marks, the bad guy. The guy that says, we're turning the lights off now. You have to leave now. You have to stop working on it now. You have to deliver now. And in those moments, you're allowed to be annoyed with them, be frustrated, and then just do it and do, you know, and, and let someone else be the bottom line. Yeah, and do your best within constraints, basically. Yeah, and you can kick off at them, you can be a moody teenager or whatever, but they're going to stand firm and they don't care if you're pissed off with them because it money's run out now, so you have to give me the movie now. Or, we, you know, we negotiated to leave at 8 p.m., so we're leaving 8 p.m., whatever it may be. So I didn't have that person, and so I was that person for myself. And that was extremely like I was sort of divided and so instead of having another person to rage at or be annoyed with or whatever version of you know conflict you want it was I redirected all to myself because it was me you know I made all the decisions I was responsible for it so it was just very very internal conflict it was very confusing I didn't understand why I felt terrible it was exactly the same thing but worse when we finally delivered the movie and it was only once I felt better that I was able to sort of, you know, hindsight is 2020. I was able to see it and realize, like, I'd split myself down the middle. So, of course, you're going to feel, but you know, because on the one hand, I felt very proud of what we'd achieved. And on the other, I wanted more time. I thought I could have done it better. I saw all the mistakes. So it was kind of like, um, it was just, it was just a challenging, <laughs> challenging yeah, period yeah. for me, emotionally. Yeah. So a couple of weeks after you finished wrapping the movie, you fell down out of uh, just the pressure releasing or you felt like you were missing some stuff or just the pressure going down? I think it was like, it's partly the come down from the adrenaline, but, but that's normal after a deadline, you know? And I think that there are ways you can cope with that. But I had a covert, very hidden internal thing going on, which was basically telling me that I'd ruined it, which is so, so harsh. I mean, so, so, so harsh. It took me a lot of thinking. And it, and it also, what I'm pleased to say is that in working through other projects and delivering on other things again and again, I have learned a new, a new way of speaking to myself about that work. But at the time, it was just brutal. I was absolutely brutal with myself. And we were still in a very unknown situation, because I knew there were, you know, I was, I was accurate, that there were still creative problems to solve. But I basically, very quietly, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize how harsh I was being, but I just, um, I, I just punished myself um, for a while. 
And uh, you started working again at that moment, or you were still off working uh, a daytime, having a daytime job? I think I went back to casting. I can't remember exactly when it was. I'm sure. I'm sure I went back to it. So Lee got all the footage and he started editing. And you, how did it work for the editing post production? I'm guessing from what you said before, you did not have a deadline, but maybe at first you had a deadline about having hitting a deadline for a first uh, cut. Or can you tell us where you were at that point in post production? My memory is a little bit hazy. I know that he sort of started assembling, and I think I left him too much to his own devices without giving him enough direction because <laughs> one result of being a very polite English person sometimes is that you too polite too English is that you're just like not forthcoming enough and you're not like clear enough with people about what you want or what you expect and you also don't ask like do you have enough information to do that so I think we had like a pretty hazy few months where he assembled some stuff and I was I was basically trying not to breathe down his neck because if I was an editor, I wouldn't want anyone breathing down my neck. But that's because I'm a director. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, so I think it was just it was just pretty weird for a while. And essentially what the first big hurdle to post-production was if there's no sound, if the rushes are mute which is basically what we had, it's extremely difficult to like access the emotion of something, you know, because that's because sound is so, 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 so crucial. So, you know, how do you judge whether one thing is working better than the other? And immediately or, or quite quickly, this huge question mark, not only about the how we would deal with the actual dialogue, was also what's going to happen with the score. And that became a very, very, very long problem that we had to solve. And I'm extremely proud of the solution, but it took, it was a hard one. It was a very, very hard one. Can you tell us what is the solution? The solution is the score, which is on the film. It was Leon Jean-Marie wrote the score. We, we wrote it together. We worked in his studio shed in his back garden for, I think, the best part of a year. He was the third composer I worked with. Okay. I'd fired two other composers that I, I wasn't even paying. <laughs> Basically, we arrived at the end with the score that you can hear and see for yourself. And the, the challenge was to create a tone, to create the right emotional tone for the scenes. Also, to, to hopefully hold the viewer in the world of the story. And at the same time, that whenever there are speech bubbles on the screen, you cannot have like melody or anything that is going to distract you from reading. Because what we realized further down the line when trying to write the score was that if there was something melodic going on, you wouldn't read the speech bubbles. So it was a really interesting, weird challenge. And by that point, I'd kind of come so far with it, I was in much better shape. And, and anyway, so yeah, like I said, I'm very, very, very proud of the score. And we got there in the end. So how long was uh, post-production, the whole process with all its ups and downs? It took two years uh, because we delivered it almost what you see today in November 2015 or December 20 yeah right at the end of 2015 so two and two and a half years maybe and we did not work on it consistently over those two years obviously because you have to go and make money and Lee had to go and edit other things I think we probably if, if I think it felt like we were working on quite drastically different films throughout that process I also spent quite a lot of time like what initially moved us into to like figuring it out was that I spent a lot of time working as a music editor would normally if you're shooting a movie and you've got a fancy composer the composer is off writing cues but you can't like the, the professionals understand that you don't watch a movie without music so you have a music editor who edits cues from other movies and puts them underneath your cut so that you can assess whether the cut is working or not like a temp temp music basically. yeah exactly okay. exactly so I did a lot of that and There was a moment, at, and it must have been at some point in 2015, like early 2015, that I figured out musically the direction that we needed to go in. And I fig I found this like really great like Hungarian synth music from the 70s. That moment and the moment of figuring out, oh, we're going to do comic book speech bubbles, were when we I found creative decisions that I knew were right. 
And from then on, it was about doing the work. And I think before I found those places, it was just, it felt like being in a, a swamp, like a weird swamp that I had made for myself. During all that time where you had different scores and things like that, you never submitted the movie, you were never tempted to submit it to festivals, or you always knew it was not done, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely. I mean, we screened it for people occasionally. We hooked up a projector and screened it for people, which was an intensely uncomfortable experience every single time we did it. Okay. Um, but ben but definitely beneficial, you know. And what I learned is that all you actually have to do is just like bring a stranger into your edit room, like or whatever your shack that you're editing on, and look at your laptop with you, and you'll you'll see your edit in a completely different way. Huh. Okay. So we did that a few times, but you know, I just I had this thing which was like had so many weird variables, but which also was, you know, had strengths, right? So the rushes looked great. And I was really happy with the performances. And I was really happy with all of the faces that were in the movie. And casting is so important to me. So there was stuff that I was really proud of. But also, it's about a female assassin who is basically lonely and wants to make friends. It hasn't got sound, so what are we doing with the score? How does the music work? And it's silent, so what's going on with these speech bubbles? So they were just these big variables. And like I said, I'm rewriting scenes, right? Like I can make, I can rewrite the scene. So every time I thought I fixed one aspect of it, the other aspect didn't work. Like it was just like this weird Rubik's Cube. I wasn't going to submit it to a festival like that. When was the moment you said it's done? Tell us, like, when was the moment you submitted it? How did you decide to proceed for the festivals? So I had a pipe dream that we could get into South by Southwest and the deadline was coming back. And and I had been like, we'd been like waving festival deadlines as like goodbye as they roll past us for for a year or two. And I thought it's tricky because I don't know I, I was so in the middle of it that I, I don't know how clear my thinking was at the time, but I was, I'm sure I was right that if we didn't have a deadline, it, we weren't going to deliver it. Well, that's what I was afraid of. So I was like, this is going to be our deadline. We're going to go for it. When was the deadline of South by Southwest? It was early November. Actually, one thing had happened that summer. There's a thing that happens here. The British Council screen films for festival programmers. It's not a secret, but it's like you know, not advertised. And it was like, you can submit your film, you wrote a little treatment about your film, and then they said yes or no as to whether it would be screened for the programmers. It was a big one. It might have been Toronto. And we got yes to be screened for them. And so that gave us an impetus. And then we didn't get selected. But it gave us like a weird buzz. And I think at that point, I was just like a woman on a mission. I was just like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. And I think what I had, where I'd been drained and I'd been burned out, I kind of had recovered my energy and my, my fight. And I decided that I was going to deliver the movie. Um, and I, I decided that any deadline was, you know, that the South by Southwest deadline was a good one to go for. And so we did. And then it got like really, really intense. <laughs> okay. Oh, a couple of other things happened. I met who is now a dear, dear friend of mine who is a post producer at the farm. And the farm is a huge post house here in London. And in this process, my grandmother had died, who was a very, very important person to me. She raised me. And she worked until she was 75 and she had a huge lake. Well, she had a house. And so I inherited money again. And I was like, right, that's going to pay. <laughs> that's going to pay for our great and our online. <laughs> Because, sorry, back at that moment, you had already spent the whole budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and also, I hadn't, I don't think I'd, I knew about sound, but I don't, and I knew about the grade, but I don't think I'd really understood like what an online meant. And how you really spit out a film at full resolution. Um, so I had this contact at the farm and she was like, I just need a little, I just need an offer to go to accounts with. And she just was another one of the godsends. I know that I already said Leon was the icing on the cake, but Danielle was the cherry on top of it all. So something about having that connection and being like, she's our post-production, she's our post-producer 
and she's a professional and I'm a professional too. You sort of, you need that connection and you need those, those things that make you feel like you're able to do it. Or at least for me, a lot of the strength comes out of great connections and great working relationships. And also just the will, the will to bend the universe to, to finish the movie. So it was really, really crunchy and we graded for a couple of days um, and they're really great at the farm. And I found this guy who let us comic books. And of course, I found a guy who he's very, very talented, extremely polite, very, very nice, and doesn't use the phone and would only be on email, wouldn't Skype with me. So we did it all via email. And like he think I think he lives in like the countryside somewhere in the north of England. Uh, so he was, was that was interesting. And, but he I think he was attracted to the project because obviously it was different to lettering a normal comic book. And we went like from the grade into the online and then straight into the sound mix. And then we uploaded it. And then and then as is now the case, you know, when you're working in digital, like all of this work compresses and crystallizes and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then it's just like one gigabyte, <laughs> all of those years of work, <laughs> just like uploaded to Vimeo and then you send it off. You handled all the festival's applications on your own, I'm assuming? I did, which was a very, very huge mistake. Yeah. Uh, I had this conversation with uh, Brian Padayan, one of the filmmakers who spoke on the podcast and uh, we talked about how taxing it is to deal with this because it needs so much organization, much more money than you assume, and uh, a lot, a lot of persistence. So, how many festivals did you? And and it, and in an ideal world, actually, you would have a strategy, which many of us don't. But uh, how how many festivals did you send the movie to? What was the process? Uh, so you applied to South by Southwest November two thousand fifteen or sixteen. 15. 15, okay. And from that moment on, it was just sending it over to other festivals, I'm guessing? Yeah. I Just, just to say, I, I think that that's accurate, what you said. Um, it takes a lot of money and a lot of persistence. But that's not actually the reason why I, it was a mistake for me. There's another aspect to it, which is that it's a skill set to sell anything. And it's a skill set that I have come to respect. And it's it's just a whole set of like language and understanding and conceptual thinking and attention to detail and stuff which is and it's not that as a filmmaker you can't be good at it some filmmakers are great at selling their own films and completely understand how to market them and a lot don't but it's just a whole job in terms of brain capacity and things to be good at and challenges basically and so the reason that it was a huge mistake for me to do it was because I was utterly burnt out. I was so burnt out, I didn't know I was burnt out. So I basically, without enough conscious thought, filled in the without a box information and then mapped all of the festivals that were coming in and picked the ones I thought would fit in tone. And after after a few months, it became clear to me that we weren't getting into the big ones. So then I pivoted and I started going for ones that had experimental strands because it, obviously this film sits in an, ex, you know, it is by definition experimental. We experimented loads of ways, even though that word is like so like deaf to a movie and like experimental it implies emotionally weird I'm not going to know the story like doesn't even have a story which none of which is true for this film it has a it has a story it's emotionally resolved anyway so you know so and I basically became quite educated about all the festivals that were out there but I was in no way like capable of seeing how I was presenting the film which was in a really bad way What, what do you mean by that? I'm curious because what do you mean by presentation and presenting your film so it would get picked, I guess? Well, I, I don't, I, I can't speak to whether there's a way you can present your film to get picked. My guess, having thought about it quite a lot, is that it's very important to have contacts. It's very important to explain to them, like to really pitch them the film. And it's just a complex Basically, I can un I can see that if you are programming a festival, small or large, it's very, very difficult to make your choices. It's very complex choices that you're making to program a festival. And so 
you're choosing a film based on loads of reasons and part of them is about the coherence of your program so who's to say how you get in and also it's like prestige and do they know you and is there a famous person etc so basically for a long time the title of this film was heartstrings and if you had read the story it made perfect sense and if you saw the film it being called Heartstrings made quite good sense. But ultimately, it was a very, very bad title, I think, for this movie. It didn't explain it, didn't summarize it. It was a bit confusing. And in terms of tone, it was just like a disconnect because this is a black and white movie about a woman that's very isolated and has got pretty hard edges. You know, underneath it, she's emotional, but we only see that later. So from the get-go, and also every time I spoke about it, I felt a disconnect people like what's it about I'm like it's about an assassin what's it called it's called heartstrings oh but you know where killing Cora is like an appropriate title for this movie (laughs) so that was a huge huge revelation to me about a year after we finished it just just the importance of a title and any filmmakers out there that listening I cannot stress to you how much you should just consider retitling your project just before you deliver it because titles make sense to you but to someone who just has no idea what this movie is it you know it's I just think it makes a huge difference so first of all it had a bad title second of all it didn't have a decent press kit we didn't have reasonable stills doesn't look professional at all we didn't have decent copy about it I didn't have a good synopsis you know all of the stuff which I think programmers rightfully expect and all of the stuff which might make it easier for them to understand, make it coherent. Because it's a bit of a challenge, it's a bit unusual. And I thought that because it was bold, I would be rewarded. And creatively, I was rewarded. And personally, pushing myself through the most extreme version of it, rather than the most safe version of it, has rewarded me in terms of like growth and what I've come to learn. So I don't regret it at all. But People just they didn't get it. And I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to sell it. I didn't understand that if you've got no awareness of something, you need something to like your mind. And especially you're talking about people that are very, very busy. They're consuming way more movies than the average person has an attention span to like even look at. So that's what I mean by it's a whole skill set to sell a movie. And maybe the filmmaker is the best person to do it. But I don't I, I, I certainly wasn't. And the, the, the problem was, was no one was, you know, I don't think there was anyone that was the p- right person to sell it. It feels so hard to give it away. It feels so hard to let someone else try and be the expert about it. But you're so close to the You're so, so close to it. And um, yeah, it needs it needs fresh eyes, I think. That's a very, very good point. I'm, I'm happy you're, you made it because it's never been mentioned before. And it's um, all you said is uh, is true this is why there's sales agents this is yeah. what they do they strategize they decide okay this movie might hit berlin so let's work our strategy so it will go through that and they know the people and yeah i mean it sounds like we're we are at a disadvantage which we are i mean yeah it's not that it's not fair. There's a number of slots for people that are unknown and uh, are just submitting through the democratic channels, let's say. But everything you said about making it easier for overwhelmed programmers who only have very few slots left for us is very important. And it's hard because this is such an... Uh, I mean, writing synopsis, and even in pre-production writing treatment and it's very hard it's very challenging very very challenging and I think that like if you have respect for it as a skill then it's easier to kind of do it and get better at it like I've got much better and so it's when you write and copy for the about page of a website you know like it's a hard thing and it's just like what's the tone you know and but it was at some point I matured and I stopped resenting the fact that I had to do it and then I started improving at it but also if you have just directed a movie it's fine if you don't feel like doing that right now you know like that is understandable if you are very very exhausted but that means you should find someone who does have the energy to do it or at least who really respects that kind of writing if you resent it and you if you don't handle it with some reverence then it, i mean you're only gonna hurt yourself and your own project 
So I want to reach right now. So can you tell us, like, you, you send it to many festivals and you didn't get in a festival, right? No, no. So this is the huge punchline. Um, and so you did ask me before how many I sent it to. And I think it was, it was definitely more than a dozen. It might not. It was maybe 20. I, I don't know. I didn't keep count. After a while, I stopped keeping count. But no, it got rejected. It got rejected left, right and center. It got big ones and small ones and even obscure little ones I'd never heard of that had no submission fee. And this led me to some profound introspection. <laughs> um, and it's just something that I, I'd like to speak to just for a moment. I mean, I, I guess I kind of said it earlier, actually, but it was the thing about being, you know, ha having divided my energy left me in a very conflicted state. I was, like I said, very, very proud of the movie. And at the same time, I felt like I was the one who had damaged it. I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, it's, I recently listened to this, in, this conversation with a guy who works for Nike. He said that he, one of their kind of, maybe mantras is too strong a word, but one of their beliefs at Nike is that what takes, that is the last 10% of the process right, of design up until manufacture, whatever, that takes a shoe, that might take a shoe from good to great, which is a very, like, Nike <laughs> type of mentality. And not everyone subscribes to that kind of thinking, but my experience with deadlines is it's those moments where you feel the time disappearing and you realize that this is it, that you reach for stuff, you know, you push for, for further, you know, you go like, oh, I have this idea, and Now's my chance. Am I going to implement my idea or not? Um, for example, it was very, very late in the process that I realized that we were missing the concept of sound effects in a graphic comic book way, right? But I've run out of time and I've also really pushed this like wonderful guy who's the letterer way further than he ever expected me to push him. So I don't think I can ask for another 18 like bits of work from him. But if I don't put them in, then I haven't acknowledge this great idea which I think is like adds a dimension and is really fun and so just to you know I don't mean to get like too deep on you but I do believe that the energy you share things with and the energy you put things out in the world with like carries with it and when it was not accepted by any single festival I had to acknowledge that I played a part in that and that's partly why I like reconsidered what I thought about copywriting and presentation and it made me think about how you know selling is a real skill set but I also made me you know and, and in that process I as time went by I felt better and I realized well maybe I you know maybe I didn't want it to be seen because I felt so conflicted about it Hmm. Which is a which is a weird one to take responsibility for, but you know it's an aspect of it. Let's say we're right now. Right now, as of today, you have a website, and on this website that is named killingcora.com, people can watch the full feature film on uh, for free. You're right now making short videos where you tackle an aspect of the process and your thoughts and lessons learned. What interests me actually is, I mean, I'll put the link and people will be able to get there. So I'll let them explore the whole website by themselves. What I, what I want to talk about is why did you decide to keep on doing that? And on the side of it, are you working on something else? Okay, well, in that order, um, for about, like, I think I kind of, like, forgot about it for about six months and sort of got on with my life and started working on some new things. And then once I realized that it really wasn't going to get into any, because the, the festival circuit, you kind of got, like, a year. I mean, you could still, like, it still might, some festivals might still want it, I don't know, but um, you've got it, you've got, like, a full year of, like, the whole thing, and that was end of 2016 into 2017 yeah and then I by then I was just feeling better and working on new things and then at some point towards the end of last year I realized that I needed to make a decision about how we shared it and obviously there's loads of there's loads of things that are available like Amazon direct and do you want to try and make it do you want to try and sell it and 
it was all these different things you could do. But the, if I didn't make a choice about how it was made available, it basically looks like I'm burying it. And having recovered and having learned so much from it, I didn't want to bury it. And also, Lee and I sat down and watched it um, probably November last year, October last year. And we both expect, we both expected to hate it and then really enjoyed it. And we were like, this is great. It's fine. <laughs> like, why were we, you know, like this is because, you know, it, well, anyway, that was the experience that we had. And it was like, actually, I'm really, I'm really excited to share this with people. And I'm, I'm really, it was a privileged position to be able to make it. And I it was so, it was so beneficial to me as a filmmaker to go through it. It was definitely painful at times, but I wouldn't, I really, really wouldn't change it. And I, and it's never been lost on me that how lucky I was to just be in the position to do it in the first place. So I just thought we'd make it available for free because it's it's the equivalent of a mixtape, you know. I don't. We became professionals in the course of making this movie, but we were not professional. I mean, we went about it as professionally as we could, and we took it very seriously. But you know, there was a tremendous amount of trial and error, and and also I like I said, it comes back to the privilege and the luck. And it's like I don't have credit card debt as a response to, as a res, as a result of this, and so I don't. To me, it's much, much more valuable that I might connect with people online. I might find that the film might find an audience that I might find some other collaborators or that I might, you know, say something useful to some other filmmakers. That is much more valuable to me than... Yeah, recouping 500 bucks. Exactly. You know, because what are you going to do charge a couple of pounds? Like, and it, you know what I mean? Like, and like I said, I'm in the, I'm in the position of not having debt from it other than the time I spent. And so if you're interested to go and look at what I mean by speech bubbles, like comic book, you know, or the score, then you can go and plug it into your speakers. And you'll hear the score that, you know, and, and, and if you're curious, you can check it out. And if you don't want to, I'm not selling it to you. You know, I, I'm not pushing it at you, like, with urgency. And how, how much would you say was the budget overall for the whole process? The whole process, I think, came out at 30 30 pounds, 30,000 pounds, sorry. Which is still a very good, very low budget. Yeah. And so are you, are you working on another feature? No. I wrote a couple of treatments for features. And I have an outline for a feature which I'm, I'm looking for a writer for. I, I, like, I worked very hard on the outline. And I felt like my writing has really improved. But... I, I don't think I'm a writer. I could co-write something, but I don't think... It's not where my instincts really, really come online. And, you know, I can problem solve. You give me an actor who's struggling with the performance, I will will make it better. We make it better in 10 minutes. No no problem. I have no doubt about that. But writing uh, is not such a strong instinct for me. And also, the landscape is so sort of confusing and strange with film and TV, and I'd, lo I'd love to make some TV. But... I. It's a, it's a tricky position because I have cut my teeth and I know that I can do the job. And like I said, what I realized was that I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could do it. And what I learned is that I 100% can. But I didn't, I didn't gain any prestige and I did it in a completely outsider way. So I think as far as like producers and production companies are concerned, I still don't really, I'm not on their radar. And... That's fine. You know, that's okay. I understand that. But I, so basically the, the sort of, I'll try and give you, I'll try and wrap up my answer, which is I'm looking for a writer to, to work on a feature. Um, but I've also for the last like 18 months have been doing improv comedy, like long form improv comedy, because comedy is definitely the direction I want to go in. And what is fascinating and challenging is that like, what is funny how do you shoot funny a lot of the time what is funny is not a lot of the time you kill the comedy when you like plan it too much and as we have learned or as I have learned filmmaking is a lot about planning so how do you rectify those two things so the the thing that I'm working on like really next as in like in the next couple of months is online sketches comedy sketch channel which is like sort of semi-improvised comedy but that's all I can really say about it at the moment Portia, I want to thank you. I knew you would be, but you were very honest and uh, generous with your process. It's interesting to hear 
the story from the Porsche you are today, but looking back to those uh, formative years, basically. And I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what is coming up next, whether it's uh, web series, TV shows, YouTube channels. As you said, like everything is quite open right now for all of us, and uh, as long as it's a good story, it doesn't really matter. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much. I'm. Um, I'm, I'm I'm delighted to talk to you about it and um, you know thank you for making a great podcast I've enjoyed it a lot This episode was produced and edited by me Nathalie Sejean the music was created by French artist Soul of Bear you can discover their techno universe on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash soul of bear you can find all the show notes along with all the previous episodes on mentorless.com slash podcast it is also the place where you can submit your story so if you completed a creative project that taught you unique lessons and you'd like to share go to mentorless.com slash podcast Click on the form at the bottom of the page and submit your story. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end. I'll see you in two weeks for our next episode. Mm -hmm.